Hello everyone, today we talk about the settlement of the post-Carolingian kingdoms, boundaries, uh, frontiers. Uh, it's important to stress this um, distinction because, of course, the, there was, as we will see now, essentially a very clear uh, demarcation of, of the borders of the various kingdoms, but still, and this is typical of post-Carolingian times, we've seen it many times, the fragmentation of the the same monarchic powers uh, in the same at some point even properly the vacancy uh, of it uh, brought to the uh, rise say from from the lower uh, nobility let's say of new uh, dominations and new lordships that were built uh, in some cases uh, from scratch as de facto uh, autonomous and independent powers to, to say uh, in general especially in the moment of greater uh, contraction properly of the uh, of public authority and the, the lack uh, uh, of an emperor up to the rise of the Ottonians and that contributed to create essentially uh, seigneuries that uh, very often also were stretching fundamentally across the same uh, uh, kingdoms and this aspect is, is relevant because from one side it shows yes a failure as we know essentially of the Carolingian um, dynasty to, to keep the, the empire together and to fundamentally also um, in the various chunks in which it was separated to, to make things work adequately but at the same time the uh, as we have seen again many times the capacities of the aristocracies lay and ecclesiastical alike to maintain uh, things you know standing uh, working um, in force even with all the limits and the shortcomings that naturally that uh, you know this just the scale of, of their uh, dominions uh, you know was you know uh, was, was uh, unavoidably presenting um, and and that yet uh, managed to still recognize at the end of the day making survive uh, the same idea of public authority of, of the king of uh, you know the same imperial title the royal one and the uh, districts that had formed in, in Carolingian times in various ways, mostly these were counties, but you know there were also uh, marks and, and duchies depending on, you know, also a relatively floating denomination, right? Uh, post Carolingian times you have, um, and also in, in the same Carolingian times as we've seen, for example, for the the history of the Duchy of Burgundy, right? It was originate how it was originated, or some you know Aquitanian. Um, realities that we we have we have observed also in dedicated videos, um, depending on the the need, right? The creation of you know, uh, say given uh, account that was, the, you know, the county was the, the basic uh, district unit. The Carolingian Empire could be in, endowed with special uh, military prerogatives, especially in the frontier areas, or at least some that had a. Um, and a very important strategic relevance, and not just frontier meant, um, you know, the outer ones uh, against peoples like I don't know the Slavs, the Bretons, um, etc. But um, really, from between the same Carolingian kingdoms, right? So areas that also, in spite of their the, the limitation, very often presented some, you know, degree of ambiguity on whose, you know, author, you know, on the authority to whom pertain those those titles and so on this was actually uh, of course not helped by the degree of fragmentation privatization especially of, of power but as we've seen many times this vassalatic beneficiary system was also a glue that managed to um to to maintain uh, uh cohesed all the the lands right that uh, had belonged to to the post Carolingian empire in fact in spite of the second invasions there were more a consequence than a cause than um, the Carolingian collapse well these kingdoms fundamentally survived right you can argue that there were at some points uh, some you know troubles uh, important ones there were some districts especially some of new creations the eastern frontier especially during the Magyar uh, invasions that risked to be um, to be destabilized at the point of, of, of collapse but fundamentally we know that these um, these areas essentially we're talking about in fact western eastern Frankish kingdoms then the Burgundian one and the Italic one remained 
in spite of this uh, clamorous, uh, you know, uh, collapse, still standing, right? And standing with all their prerogatives and institutions and royal titles uh, and so on, right? And, and naturally, this is because, you know, uh, these were still some of the most uh, developed areas in Europe were, um, were uh, still inhabited by, by communities that were capable, in fact, of providing for their own self-defense, administration, justice, and so on. They had had important uh, political traditions, um, cultural legacies, and so on. So, depending, of course, as we've seen also in many of these comparative videos with post-Carolingian kingdoms, that I find to, to be extremely important and very underrated, um, they, um, there was, um, you know, still a, the, the recognition that fundamentally the for example, mon uh, royal power was, was needed. It was a way, even in those cases when the aristocracies were trying to, to escape centrifugally to monarchic authority, still a mean for self-legitimization, uh, because, of course, um, as in, I, I presume that the Western Frankish kingdom is, is the best example, the, um, the degree of... Uh, of, of uh, of the centralization at that point, uh, and uh, the the obvious realization that this was was a problem, for example, for coping for, with the Norman invasions, etc., brought to an important part still of these communities to 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 actually attribute importance to to the monarchic role for uh, for the sake of defense. Right. So we can't just see it, you know, of course, this thing as a class issue. Right. All the noblemen everywhere were just interested in, in demolishing royal authority. It, it was obviously not true, right? As long as it was a king, there was always kind of a um, bipartisan system where, you know, one side, even though maybe still hoping to carve privileges and, you know, power on, on their own that could make them also compete for royal power, uh, for the royal title and so on, but still, of course, side with the same institution that we're hoping also to, to seize for themselves. And the Western Frankish Kingdom being the best examples because in a sense it was one of, uh, maybe even the least obvious of the post carolingian kingdoms to survive and yet um, uh, because of, actually because of that uh, the, the highest degree of privatization this enormous uh, estates uh, at that point they, that had been from centuries even Carolingian, Merovingian times in the hands of just a few privates that uh, had an enormous uh, individual power um, was the uh, was the kingdom that managed to still remaining to, to, pr to, to create eventually the, the largest power of these all, ready right, to recompact later on to, to become actually the largest power in Europe at some point over a long time but this stressing however how much the public collapse is not necessarily left by a, a vacuum, right? And, and very often it, it's quite the other way around. It's still this private system is still the base for a further development of some sort of, of public relevance, right? So you can argue that in the Western Frankish case, it was like a, a broader competition between the higher uh, nobility that still detained factually a lot of power. Whereas you can argue that even the success of the Eastern Frankish Kingdom under the Ottonian dynasty and the Renovatio Imperi was connected exactly to the the actual lack of power um, of the individual princes, at least uh, in the measure in which they, they, their, especially the international fortune, depended largely on the support that the other princes decided to tribute them in an elective fashion, right? Which also shows that uh, it is possible and the Ottonian success is a good example of that, of still working with a essentially a, 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 say a federal system with important degrees of autonomies in order to you know invest, especially abroad. Um, that case in the Mediterranean, reconnecting with with the Roman imperial crowning and so on, with the, the broader universal power, right? And there are always um, important implications in this regard of why eventually also the, the Burgundian kingdom fundamentally not just failed, but um, eventually kind of disappeared historically, or why the Italic one, uh, for example, continued 
um, even without having such, you know, high degree of, you know, uh, well, relatively of higher nobility that could hegemonize the entire system or even claim suzerainty factually on, on, on the various parts um, of, of Italy, um, but still survived institutionally. Right, and even when the German emperors came to rule on that, and even when the Italic monarchy properly, um, you know, in the absence, in fact, of the of the Germanic expeditions, also didn't didn't substan substantiate itself, because by the 11th century, eventually, what no no Italic king was properly ever elected a a again, and you know that the, the the further step would be that the rise of the communes, and so something very different. But even in that case, the Italic crown remaining, and who have explained why this thing happened after all. It had to do crucially also with the with the Carolingian tradition attributed to the Longobard kingdom of being effectively the one containing Rome or at least, you know, having the, the great the protection of Rome and so to which automatically the imperial title was connected independently from the fact that you know, see this could have happened with I don't know with, with France or with Germany. Right. The Germans at some point would think that because of course after the Renovatio Imperium it was this other uh, ob objectively informal decision that normally would be in the Eastern Frankish Kingdom that such matter, of, you know, who would eventually descend to Italy and become emperor uh, had been, you know, established and recognized. The French, uh, even though at some point even stronger than the Germans, um, at least, you know, much later on, um, were, uh, were claiming the same thing. And this in part also because the the crown could pertain to any prince coming from all of these kingdoms, not necessarily just to one. So these naturally are things that we have discussed elsewhere. We, we won't be much repeating today, but they are important to understand in perspective. To understand in perspective, for example, of the administrative traditions that existed in the Italian kingdom as opposed to, you know, north of the Alps where there was factually no, no kind of state or um, tradition of sort, right? The Carolingians had tried to do that, importing a lot from the Longobard kingdom and the Roman tradition, but the same collapse of the Carolingian kingdom arg uh, empire arguably is, is fundamentally a consequence of that of lack, right? Of that absence that uh, could not make uh, space but to the to the same privates that had just fueled the same construction of, of the um, Carolingian empire as long as, you know, it was a, just a matter of, of expansion, right? So of new land and, and communities grabbing in, in that sense. Um, so we are looking at um, you know a system that was starting to be controlled on an ever more local level and as a consequence uh, what, what is important to stress here is that we can look at maps of course and maps are always approximate approximated by by definition but it's important to stress here that um, the the sceneries that formed as we've seen also even across the various uh, kingdoms boundaries uh, are not really representable right in part because sometimes they're really very small so you couldn't really have a comprehensive scale of, of of their totality of their quantity also of their intensity there are areas that were maybe you know contained territorially but were very powerful um, others that were more extended of course you know the, the things could overlap so there are too many factors that you not cannot really represent graphically uh, on a map um, and so it's important in theory to, to follow all the uh, event local uh, dynamics and dimensions and so I, I think on Schwerpunkt we, we, we can also try to do that at some point because some some districts, some some seigneuries, some principalities, duchies, bishoprics are really, uh, you know, really made a, a great work of civilization in this context when, again, the dual system was falling apart and they managed to defend their communities, to, you know, to, to, ex to carry out justice, to, to control the territory, um, and so on. Um, and, and for the rest, realizing that, however, comprehensively this system was about so many d districts, greater and smaller, mm -hmm. in which the post carolingian kingdoms were articulated, right? And it often depended also on the previous tradition. For example, the, the Eastern German, um, the Eastern Frankish um, districts were normally larger, right, territorially. 
because the land was in part less populated, um, there were there was still politically speaking um, an overlapping with the original so-called ethnic duchies, uh, which is actually an indicator of the of the limits of the same districts to you know to to overflow, let's say, from their boundaries and taking over others. And this is a state of things that in Germany would last for you know for, for many centuries. I I think we will start a new series about the Hohenstaufen now, and so we'll see at the beginning that still at the time of Frederick Barbarossa the, those at least main four ethnic duchies were still kind of there, right, and and, and function. You can argue from from that long. Um, and uh, in, in in the Western Frankish Kingdom, for example, were much more intricated, right? They they were uh, much more disconnected, disarticulated territorially, I, apparently in a you know disorderly way, but not not quite so, because in fact it's not much about the territorial conti con um, continuity, but rather you know the the political um, influence that you can exercise all around. So that's something you can't simply represent on a map. Uh, in Italy, they often revolved around cities, right? And the ancient, uh, in fact, you know, districts that were most, you know, heavily, that had this heavily urbanized net that, in a sense, contributed to the urbanization of the Frankish, let's say, uh, Frankish Longobard uh, elite there. And so, at the end of the day, also diluting, by the end of the 11th century, the same feudal powers that had formed uh, also in Italy after the, the Frankish conquest by this, in fact, um, Carolingian in, in injection of a Salatic beneficiary system that had somewhat lowered the, uh, the, the the importance of the middle classes, made this great aristocrats rise equally. Um, and so you understand these same districts as such, right, they were originally something historical, they mostly overlapped with the, the dioceses historically since the time of Diocletian in the Roman administration that had lived on and some, some others had been created from scratch as we are saying for example in the case of, of Germany it was f finished to be, to be conquered fundamentally by, by, by the Carolingians themselves that had colonized it since Merovingian times um, but at, at this point whatever they or, their origin had been they started losing in importance per se Right, um, and they 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 changed in nature, literally. They they would become essentially, even from a geographical point of view, temporary boundaries of political powers that were continuously becoming. Right, that were for dynastic, patrimonial, economical, military, whatever reasons, ever change. Right, in certain cases expanding, structuring, in other cases collapsing, etc. Never underestimate in this sense the same reason why the same Carolingian Empire in its entirety uh, as ideally the private possession of a single dynasty um, were subjected to this law of, you know, in theory equal repartition of the fathers in inheritance among the, the male sons, right? The Carolingians tried towards the, la the latter phase to put an end to this, but at least, you know, yes, giving part of the narrative, but at least in more contained ways to the to the younger sons and trying to to, to provide a greater continuity to at least to to the elderly ones. So try to keeping to, to keep things compact, right? And so uh, you you can argue in a way that um, even the traditional boundaries of, of these countries that would roughly form more or less what we see today is France, Germany, Italy, and so on, that they um, uh, that they were not to be given for granted by the 9th century, where all these big ad adjustments were, were, were happening, were, were continuing, often the struggles between the, um, the children of Louis de Pius and eventually their successors, and so on. So there were the, these um, uh, dynamics were heavily subjected also to, to randomness in the form of, you know, biological continuity, procreation, inheritance in this sense. So, um, and this is a very important um, character because still these um, systems were working by by some rules that as such were recognized in a um, true logic that were not just, you know, the strong, the one of the stronger or at least, you know, those who couldn't boast some degree of legitimacy that could be uh, 
um, you know, it could interfere somewhat in the ratio of strength that existed uh, at a local level. And of course, the, 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 the support of the local nobility was always a crucial uh, aspect of such, uh, such games of power. Um, so, they, um, th there was something beyond the mere administrative um, or, you know, mm, let's say, mm, border function of the districts that such uh, entities were, were acquiring, right? Um, there was um, almost a traditional dimension was start being affirmed customarily in this regard. I mean, let's be honest. Think about, yes, you, you would argue that, I don't know, Western French and Eastern French were kind of, you know, easily identifiable because you say, you know, it's more or less from one side they spoke, at least majority of people spoke Romance, and from the other side they, they spoke Germanic. It's as if we were talking about France and Germany. Yes, but in a sense, yes, tendentially, if you pick the extremes in an over-characterization, uh, there was nothing like even an uh, an identity of this kind because still you know the properly if there was any kind of national identity like in the Eastern Frankish Kingdom it was still still parcelled in the various ethnic duchies even in the Western Frankish Kingdom there was Aquitaine in Occitania broadly meant it was simply something completely on its own in a sense uh, you know historically the same Brittany um, and so what we see of Northern France is mostly what had been in Austria right but also there was famously enough this very uh, also large um, reality in the middle that stretched from the from from the North Sea to the Alps uh, and that was originally attached to, to the same Italy and, and the imperial crown that was the so-called Lotharingia so literally the, the possession of Lothar that was actually the the most prestigious one because Lothar was the the, the, the elderly uh, uh, child um, and um, of, of, of Louis de Pierre's and uh, he, he was also emperor for, for, for that matter and he was ideally controlling the two capitals of the empire so uh, Aachen and Rome uh, at the same time with the only difference that while Rome was framed still within uh, the, the, the boundaries of what had been a kingdom historically uh, Lotharingia was a, a complete invention that had not existed historically. Like, it, in, in part, it, uh, I mean, it, yes, it was kind of overlapping certain parts of, 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 uh, of Neustria and Austrasia at the same time, but also the lower parts, uh, certain, certain chunks of, um, uh, you know, of, of areas that had, had not had that kind of con ethnic continuity historically and no political or uh, administrative u unitary tradition. And th that's interesting because you know that, um, uh, in fact, no country would factually emerge from those areas. I mean, unless you take properly the northern part with the ne the Netherlands, etc., that began to 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 have a properly a political unity and a sense of nationality and administrative homogeneity just by the end of the Middle Ages, right? And um, still. Uh, you know, whoever ruled there, even if these were somewhat advanced places, rich already at the time, depending, right, there were some also, you know, depressed areas, uh, also some kind of ethnic allogen element, like the Frisians, that the, the, the Franks had conquered from in relatively recent times. Uh, but um, historically, they, they would never give birth to, like, a real country on its own. The only, uh, the only effect we talked about some time ago, historically, that is partly the consequence of this, is and the decentralization between an engulfed France and an engulfed Germany historically was the Burgundian state that however arguably collapsed even though it was very rich and prosper and in this sense uh, coveted by the, its neighbors um, it didn't really have a, a real a, a national unity of any sort it was a sort of of, 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 of uh, some of dynastic possessions that had come to, to exploit you know the, 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 the crisis of France during the Hundred Years War the 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 historical fragmentation of of uh, of, of the electoral German monarchy, um, and and that you know just towards the end of the Middle Ages and the the compaction of you know what would become kind of modern states this this thing was you know eaten alive and dismembered among the the two sides. But let's say 
uh, you wouldn't explain that if it had been a a country that suffered even much a, a, a much heavier crisis like france for example during the hundred years war they could literally collapse and that instead not only didn't but you know reaffirmed its own unity afterwards speaking of a national continuity that had existed from centuries was based on something more than just you know uh, you know uh, literally a drawing on a map right so again the even the this original post Carolingian kingdoms repartitions were somewhat can say accidental again because there was some rationale to them but the the, the specific boundaries those were somewhat random right and still floating for a very long time uh, over time or at least you know having a um, you know a, a different political allegiance over time because that's also how we have to reason not in 19th century nationalist terms like we're talking about 9th 10th 11th century powers uh, and just like today arguably uh, however it's always about winning the decisive moral support of the local community otherwise you cannot rule in, on any anywhere right any country any any community um, so of course when we look at post Carolingian times we see um, for some of reasons did also the emergence of this proto-national feelings right the idea of a Teutonic kingdom for example uh, was was yes was an elite creation emerging for the first time literally in some monasteries like like Fulders and Gallen um, in, uh, in in uh, you know in the Eastern Frankish kingdom to, to realize that the broader coordination that the G German ethnic duchess had started to you know to, to, to see as a you know, in terms of elite, as a as a profitable um, soldalist, say, um, and it's from this time, in fact, that we st we can't even start talking about such identities. Of course, f for a country like Germany, was more difficult because uh, Germany never had had even that kind of obvious. I mean, Germany doesn't have real boundaries. Right, especially in the east, but in, in not in case the post Carolingian thing would show you is not even in, in the west, o o on which it had been expanding, by the way, historically, because also, uh, you know, the boundary between Gaul and Germany had been the Rhine in uh, Roman times. Instead, in early medieval times, things started changing. The, the, some Germans migrated west. I mean, it had already happened under Roman times, so let's say this thing was further, you know, uh, affirmed. For example, post Carolingian times is what you you would see as uh, the city of Strasbourg um, becoming part of the Duchy of, 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 uh, of Alamannia, one of the German ethnic duchies. Before it wasn't really like that, and this was that was part of Lotharingia, actually, not historically of, of, of Alamannia. The same goes for the broader Lotharingia itself that was, um, first of all, at the end of the 9th century, properly, after many struggles that continued up to actually in the 10th century up to Louis the fourth of France that claimed bet between you know the two king the east and western front uh, to to say no it's mine no it's mine it, it, it fell to to the east right so Lotharingia became effectively part of the Holy Roman Empire um the bound in, in a sense some boundaries kept floating you know that especially in medieval times when France recompacted as a you know as a unit a unitary strong kingdom especially in the 13th century where conversely the, the German monarchy was at that point going in the same, uh, in, in exactly the opposite direction. There were some further, you know, attempts to re expand, to reform uh, French authority in the northeast in some way. Um, and so the, the boundaries were blurred. And the same Burgundian state, as we have seen, was, was actually across the, you know, starting as a French power from the Dutch of Burgundy, but it started collecting these territories across France and the Empire, right? And it's obvious that in post Carolingian times, uh, the there was a, a de facto power was mostly measured measured on political military bases that were at that point showing what the real frontiers actually were, and yet the uh, the nominal boundaries maintained themselves as official lines of demarcation between the spheres of uh, lay and ecclesiastical policy 
um, that could claim, right, their preponderance, their, say, jurisdictional supremacy pertaining to the single kingdoms. And this is how it happened that the, the, the border, for example, between the uh, Western Frankish uh, kingdom, the Eastern Frankish kingdom, and the one of Burgundy remained formally throughout all the Middle Ages, the limit marked uh, since the uh, late uh, Carolingian times between, in fact, the uh, mostly as a reference, the, the Western Frankish kingdom proper and the contiguous uh, ones, uh, with the, together with the complex and mobile juridical net of uh, vassalatic connection, right? And uh, think about the same Burgundy. At some point, it could some some uh, Burgundy uh, was an entity that eventually split between the Dutch and the county. You know that there was this formal boundary. It's, uh, eventually, there could be um, at some point not much of a of a separated you know county of, of Burgundy fitting in the in the Burgundian kingdom from one side and separated from the Dutch of Burgundy in the Western Frankish kingdom from the other. At some point, there could be some Burgundian rulers that could literally expand more in the west by an annexating that 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 uh, that district and still having some possessions in in northern Italy at the same time. So creating um, dynasties at that point that could have changed uh, literally the, the destiny of Europe in terms of political balance and so on. So we often underestimate them because eventually, you know these powers tend to always recompact in in ways that at that point seem to be you know you kind of already know them because even just in memory you know you can they kind of they're kind of similar to the modern countries but the post colonial times is is a seminal phase of certain uh power balances that uh, have not to be given for granted could have gone literally for banal things like biological continuity discontinuity in, in, in very different ways. Very different ways. And this is especially true, again, not much about the boundaries themselves, but about the concreteness of the powers that are actually um, ruled within them. Right? And again, you, 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 nobody would expect that Western Frankish Kingdom would, would sort out itself rather than that, I don't know, the Burgundian or the Italic crowns would be depleted of, let's say, o of their monarchic uh, substance. Uh, one could could even say, you know, that the Ottonians were not forcefully to, necessarily to raise to power, or that they could have, just because of the outcome of a single battle, managed to, to defeat the Magyars and therefore, you know, change history the way it did, or reconnecting Germany with the the Italic Kingdom, for example, that is arguably one of the uh, you know surely at least one of the single most important things that ever happened in, in, in medieval Europe, um, because of all the 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 the, the, the scholarly appalling implications that this had for for the same mm, the Gregorian re reforms, the investiture controversy, the communal phenomenon, humanism, the the um, and you know the same possibility of the creation of of a unitary Germany uh, German national monarchy uh, like England or France, so things that would have changed everything in the history of the Western world and the world entire. Um, well, this started at this time, and that's why it's so under uh, such an underrated period and, and context in general. Um, so. Uh, through the older borders uh, during the centuries, there were um, th there was a deep intertwinement of relations and integrations between the elites of different kingdoms and their territorial acquisitions, for which. Um, for example, if a dynastic, uh, a same dynastic scenery located at the border of two kingdoms found itself 
often to dominate regions that were officially subordinated to two different kings, right? And you you can argue that something similar happened too by the end of the 11th century, also in the relation between the Kingdom of England and the Kingdom of France, right? And this, however, was the effect of the conquest of the English Kingdom operated by the Duke of Normandy that was vassal of the King of France. So uh, that's a bit of a different thing because there was literally uh, the conquest of an entire kingdom that passed also as kind of a personal possession to, to William the Conqueror and still um, dwelt... See, this is kind of paradoxical because France had already kind of come out let's say, of the game, the, the imperial game system. And France had been actually the, the actual cradle of Carolingian power, historically, uh, territorially. Um, and yet, it had not, uh, it had stopped at that point participating to the, to the imperial race, right? Uh, by the time France became like a solid kingdom, uh, the Holy Roman Empire, the axis between Germany and Italy had already been long established and also, broadly speaking, from a political strategical point of view, it was not really yet a French interest to, for example, intervene in Italy, which is something that would take the 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 unification of the, the modern, you know, territory of France before it it start happening again. That kind of happened by the you can argue by the 13th century. Yes, there's an important French expansion in the Mediterranean, but it's not before the Italian wars that literally France said, you know, again, Italy is like an extension of, of myself, really. And that's something that, I don't know, uh, Louis, um, I mean, Charles the, uh, the Bald would have, would have thought, right, when he descended in Italy to claim the crown for himself, and, you know, also the, the Eastern Franks descended, and, you know, the two armies were about to, to, to make another butchery, like the one of Fontenoy, but they stopped and said, okay, well, you know what, uh, you can get the imperial title that Louis uh, the Bald would got, but still, you know, go away from Italy anyway, because it's not your business, and fundamentally, you know, Charles had many more problems in France to care about the Italic kingdom, uh, the Germans at that point yet didn't have much of a, a capacity to extend their control on Italy differently from what would happen in the next century, um, and so the thing had settled, that was a moment of crisis, a moment of contraction, so uh, that is also explained. As we were saying before, it's relevant even that since Louis de Pius, it was decided that uh, the imperial crown had to be somewhat associated, first of all, to the papal crowning, and, and secondly, institutionally, from the Italic kingdom that was actually recognized institutionally by the same Charlemagne back in the day as a peer of the Frankish power, meaning that Charlemagne was king of the Franks and the Longobards, unlike any other conquered people that had been subdued, in fact, uh, before, because of the the great importance that Charlemagne tributed, in fact, to the to to the Italic Kingdom, already at that time administratively, and because of the prestige that derived uh, from that, and the the Longobard legacy, the pr the protection over the papacy, and so on. Even though the papacy also believed that not to to belong to any to any kingdom at that point, as the Church was kind of something even outside the same empire. That's yet another issue, but. As you understand, it was an ambiguity that existed, in fact, ever since um, Charlemagne's time, uh, or even since Constantine, or even before, as you can see, but that would, in fact, not be technically ever solved in a, in a, in a full fashion between the secular and, and the ecclesiastical universal powers. Um, now, speaking of Italy, that's interesting because... Mm, you see, by the, the 10th century, the mid-10th century, Italy was brought under the, uh, the, the, the Ottonian rule. The Ottonians, as you know, they, they rose to power as dukes of, um, of, of Saxony and uh, also uniting mostly, bound, bounding strongly with Franconia. So essentially, these were respectively the, the most militarized of the... Eastern Frankish Kingdom and the uh, um, in the 
the most florid economically and also the ones that had inherited the Frankish grandeur, also by name, Franconia, in fact, of the Eastern Frankish Kingdom. Um, and the, because of their leadership, their success, their defeat of the Magyars and the, the stop of, the, of, of their invasion uh, in Germany, etc., um, Otto the first was endowed with this you know already his father had been offered the crown but he was recognized as emperor he descended in Italy he was crowned um, after having brought under control the region so that marked the so-called Renovatio Imperi in fact as it's called and the the ideal birth er, in, in 962 of what we call Holy Roman Empire the whole thing is all messed up. There was never such a thing. Like, uh, first, first of all, it's not until uh, Frederick Barbarossa's time that you know the, the the this this power was called Holy Roman Empire. At the time, was still um, you know essentially the same empire that Charlemagne had created. So there was no real discontinuity. It was there had been mostly kind of an interregnum, or at least partially, in the sense that some Italic princes, for example, also some Burgundian ones had um, seized the imperial crown by papal crowning, but just because they were closer to Rome, um, and they, they had managed to do that, but let's say this this idea that somewhat the older empire had been repristinated under the, the Ottonians that had brought, again, at least this transalpine power um, in, a, let's say, uh, and uh, you know, uh, bringing under control uh, the Italian kingdom was seen as the the accomplishment, the fulfillment of that uh, of that promise, of that duty, that task. Um, and as you know, this changed a lot of things because at the time, uh, any uh, attempt of a other Italic uh, aristocrat to claim. Uh, not just the, the imperial title, but even the, the same uh, Italic kingship was denied because technically that was uh, was covered uh, by, by, by the Ottonians, Otto the first, Otto the second, Otto the third, etc. Also Henry the second put down the, the last um, attempts of an, an Italic aristocracy to, to establish a monarchy, an Italic monarchy on their own. Um, and um, and so you you know it, it's a known problem if you actually know the the context but let's say you, somebody could argue why at that point was there still like an italic kingdom distinguished from let's say the german one um or why even a burgundian one in in this sense where it couldn't be just a unitary entity right just as the 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 carolingian empire historically had been just one. Well, the idea is that the, the Carolingian power was, was properly imperial in nature since Merovingian times. That is to say, that it was a, a people, the Franks, that in their views were the elect people, the chosen people, the holy people, and that they, um, also in a brutally bloody military sense, would subdue and r repress systematically any other uh, power around. So that there were the Franks surrounded by all these either tributary uh, states, the, the Aquitanians, the Burgundians, the Alamanni, eventually, and on and on, the, the Saxons, the, the, the Frisians. And so um, it's obvious that in late Carolingian times, these conquests had brought to a, probably a Frankization of all these territories, um, including Italy at that point. And so um, the this idea of, you know, of a of a central people that would kind of rule over the others were, was blurred because we've just seen that the areas from which essentially the empire had started mostly pertained as heartland of, to the to, to the western Frankish kingdom at that point those were the, the first ones essentially to bail out of the imperial game of all these others this reflected we've seen their limits the local context and the, not even even the limits of the other powers in a sense that you know just exploited geographical proximity to, to claim the imperial title. So the, the the Saxons, the Ottonians, did something that ha went beyond that. It was properly like this other people, the Saxons, kind of conquering other peoples, bringing the the Longobards down again, um, and managing to, to reach and to secure the, the Roman 
uh, the control of Rome itself, so that you know, under Otto the Third, this is the the Acme, the idea that probably if there was a Germanic emperor ever ruled from Rome. That was factually the only one, or barely so, because of all the revolts in the city. But um, still, right, that was crucial, seminal, because of all, for example, the the you know, the uh, the policy of the bishops counts, the the boosting of this also protocol, you know, say municipal way of uh, ruling over the Italian kingdom that was factually not really controllable otherwise, so creating this divide also between the city and the countryside, that a countryside had, had been the place of election, especially north of the Alps, for the creation of these important uh, lordships that would rule privately from the Arab. In Italy it was different because you could make leverage on the city, and so it was easier, let's say, for the Ottonians to float in there by exploiting these divisions, and essentially the fact of confirming just the rulers that already existed before their conquest there, so even the, the actual direct grip on the Italian kingdom was very problematic, as in fact the Ottonians came to, to, to experience, and so uh, if anything, this idea that, I mean, theoretically, any emperor at that point would have preferred Rome over any transalpine area to dominate, but the problem is that the, the, the main possessions of and, and base of power of these uh, emperors was north of the Alps, and in case of the Ottonians, even further, much north of the Alps, right, you know, in, in Saxony, from the northern Germany. So this, on the longer run, brought to, historically, as you know, to the, you know, say, to the factual discorporation, again, of the Italic kingdom from German, uh, the, the German one. And so this intermittent moment of vacancy of imperial rule of which also the communes would benefit so that when Frederick and Barbarossa came and it was again difficult to bring them under and the, the, broger, the broader project in fact of the Ollenstaufen failed in that sense and others in fact of you know attempt to, to bring this this you know the, the kingdom down or at least you know to to secure the imperial crown which didn't even necessarily mean to be able to permanently occupy the country, which, which in fact never happened. Um, and so um, uh, it, it was mostly a political issue. And at that point, even late, we're talking a bit later on from this period, the issue was mostly uh, not securing one, uh, one territory, right? This was paradoxically more important, in fact, in post carolingian times, but securing the electoral support, where it was of the Germans, the Italians, the the Bohemians, the Burgundians, whatever, um, and and so extending by properly sphere of influence and prestige and capacity of a, of local intervention to in in areas that were developing importantly, and so always had kind of a pro-imperial and anti-imperial faction. So in order to gather that power, it was not even important to it was important to be strong to have a deterrent power and to in fact, uh, threaten a military intervention in some areas, but at that point it was not much of about uh, securing a, a, a firm territorial grip, uh, control, direct control was factually impracticable for most of these areas, but to just receive their support, right, uh, against still other local opponents that, if crushed, could have reinforced at least the position of these other imperial supporters and by their cooptation in the imperial system in theory managing to control the matter in, in fact this was a bit the, the broader aim eventually of the Ghibelline faction that is to say to especially in the Italian kingdom to bring down this uh, hypertrophic uh, communal development that had created so many like tens of city states that were all kind of independent and starting to reaffirm instead the older feudal districts that could, you know, bring to the hegemonization of, of, of larger areas, even over the cities by the side of some local rulers that could receive their feudal title by the emperor and, and therefore to be better controlled. Um, so the reason, however, why um, the Italic crown remained even uh, uh, even the Burgundian one, um, under the uh, um, a, a sole ruler, right? The the dynastic union 
under a single king like you like like Otto the first is that such fragmentation was in a sense by that point paradoxically more functional um, to the uh, for winning the support of the local communities than not because you see First of all, there were important boundaries, like polit I mean, geography, contrarily to this one, most, mostly believed, it's, it's not really a decisive factor in, in history. But still, you can understand it by the 10th, 11th century. I mean, even just organizing an expedition from across the Alps, from Germany to Italy, was, was a big deal, right? So that was already a big political proof, meaning that if you had the means just to do it, it means you were powerful and yet once you cross the Alps, it was still uh, yet another challenge because of the resistance you could meet. And so you had to confirm that by reaching Rome and getting the crown. And so also seeing what, what would happen again with the relation with these local vassals. But it, it's, it's obvious that the reason why this, uh, like a kingdom like Italy or the one of Burgundy, kept existing even within probably the Holy Roman Empire as, as districts on, on their own. Um, and they were not wiped out, unlike what the Franks had historically done with the king of, of Burgundy or the king of the Alamanni. They had all be brought to, to something else, uh, something less than a kingdom, right? A duchy, mostly. So something properly less in the hierarchy. Is that, of course, first of all, the communities that inhabited these regions were powerful. As we've seen, there was factually never a way to really bring them down right mostly more of the their the suzerainties in these areas depended on fact on the support of the same local communities itself that were interested in fueling that dy uh, dynamic right because also all the bishops that were confirmed in their rule on the city districts uh, in the italian kingdom for example were all you know parts of some aristocratic family that had interests against one another etc so it was easy to play again on, on these divisions and obviously what what should have the germanic rulers done they should have arrived in italy and said you know this kingdom doesn't exist anymore now it's just a, a german kingdom it depends on the emperor and so all the carolingian tradition also of the uh of the the iron crown uh the iron crowning of lombardy and then the uh all the the the, the administrative and institutional importance that the prerogative uh, and tradition that, that this country had even in function of the Roman crowning doesn't exist anymore it's just you know we will have the, the power of how would I how could they do that right with which power with which uh, factually they would have had to literally wipe out anything that existed there and was impossible um, so it's obvious that the continuity remained because the, the Italic vassals had all again the interest playing with the emperor in these terms and so um it was quite easy to, you know, nobody, I, I presume, ever thought even to to eliminate that king uh, historically was uh, just uh, too late. I mean, it, it, again, it could have happened had there been a such a, a great historical force like it had been in, in Carolingian times in relative terms. Well, throughout the Middle Ages, there factually wasn't. There was not, a, there was any, there wasn't any power in Europe that ever managed to take over like most of it and re redrawing stuff and you know not meeting resistance whatsoever so um, everything was calibrated and balances of power that again had been established before traditionally and continued like this and interestingly enough reinforced themselves over time because again the kingdom of Italy never had a king on its own except for the Germanic rulers historically later on but it still remained, meaning that the, the Italians knew that they lived in a kingdom that had it still maybe a backhand title, a royal title, but this is this they still had it. Right? So until Charles V, there were kings of Italy in that sense. Well of course there was Napoleon who recreated that eventually, you know, the, the Italian unification is a is also a completely different thing. But historically, like this Think had been recognized up to the modern age as a as an important office 
by the way, for a universal ruler, especially the one of the Holy Roman Empire, and there Charles V is, is, not, a, is not just an anecdotal name. And you understand that in this, France factually did not exist. I mean, yes, there were at some point some attempts to, I don't know, by French or Spanish uh, or even English kings to be elected um, uh, kings of the Romans, and in that sense, would, as would be Holy Roman emperors, but the connection that was established between Germany and Italy was never disconnected historically. Uh, it remained always there, and again, it had happened randomly, because again, in theory, any, any Western Christian prince and especially more those who had belonged to the post-Carolingian world had could be elected Holy Roman Emperor, right? So there was also a debate, interestingly enough, we made a video in the summer about 12th century Germany. Uh, there were some interesting, <laughs> there was some interesting English literature that said, you know, why did the Germans monopolize this this prerogative, right? Is there is it written anywhere, right? It, there, there was a debate that. Uh, is interesting because if you if you think about contemporary history, that something that was still, you know, something that I don't know the the German, the other German empires believed at some point uh, taking over Europe and you know that's something that uh, Germany still today as the major uh, European power is, uh, you know, is, is still playing as a, a in um in an hegemonic direction. So it's it's interesting because you see how much of our past actually is is I mean of, of, of post Carolingian times is still here right in terms of identities of of nations of policies of course it, it's very different in nature but uh, it's it's connected to that um, the same goes for the the Burgundian crown by the way which was a bit more uh, unstable, especially by the time it was, in fact, seized by the, the Ottonians, by the Holy Roman Emperors, for good at some point. Uh, and, and that was properly a, a very empty thing, meaning that Burgundy itself didn't have a even an evident consistency, like Burgundy was split into various areas, mostly also mountainous ones. It, it, yes, some were rich, especially Provence, the so-called Kingdom of Ireland, and so on, but still there are different areas of Europe also with different different watersheds, different languages. Let's say the Italic Kingdom was at least as far as Lombardy was concerned, and also Tuscany it was well connected since Longobard times properly to the to the uh, administration of the king, the direct control of the king were as also dramatically productive in areas of Europe. So it doesn't matter how small but still having an enormous potential. Uh, were quite compactly and evidently um, uh, so. And, and yet, even in there, there were important divides. For example, I think everybody knows that uh, in this period, for a while, um, the Dutch of Bavaria included uh, northeastern Italy as well. It arrived up to the, the Adriatic Sea. That's also interesting because historically, northeastern Italy was ever more in fact, tied to the to the Germanic area, uh, it had important connections. Uh, think about the Mark of Verona, that had also produced some kings of Italy and emperors in that sense. Um, there, there is the Brenner Pass, so for any, I mean, it was of strategical relevance because of all the, all the German expeditions to Italy passed through there. Um, so even later on, mm, there was a, a Ghibelline feeling mostly gravitating around those areas and an important, um, let's say, footstep, let's say that in Holy Roman Emperors could, could have properly in Italian matters. They weren't the only places, by the way. It was mostly, also in there, a matter sometimes of, sur literally of survival of the old um, feudal mm, families, let's say, of, of older times, you know, and think about Montferrat, for example. Um, or the Piedmontese area that never played much of an important role, let's say after the the eleventh or thirteenth century, uh, the eleventh century in a in a it says it, a power in itself. It was mostly Lombardy that kind of you know and, and it, the connections with it that that made the thing. But uh, importantly enough, 
um, for example, during the 11th century was across the Western Alps the creation of a principality that in this sense was across also the, the, the Italic and Burgundian boundaries that um, was uh, suggested, albeit not still realized, by the marriage of Adelaide, who was the heiress of the power of the Marquises of, of Turin, with a member of the comital, uh, a, a, a Burgundian of the um, comital dynasty of the uh, Umbertins, from which, by the way, the Counts of Savoy would descend, which shows how even in, in in Italy how blurred the and how theoretical um, its borders were uh, at such point um, and so it's um, it's another very important chapter of European history is, uh, is underrated especially the more it uh, goes towards the modern age is even it's in its approximation that represented by the alpine chain it did not prevent the elites south of the alps to participate to the german elections of uh, the king which is something that you would be surprised at how consistent i mean uh, it was also numerically speaking and this is kind of paradoxically even more evident in this earlier time. This is to say, you can find some uh, Italic vassals living, in fact, south of the Alps, but even literally going to Germany for the election of the Eastern Frankish king. And this, this reveals you how also permeable the thing was, because, you know, electing the king was, was first of all, deciding who he was, so it was not yet, say, yeah, of course, it was being open to the idea that this would be the next ruler and therefore potentially, as this tradition had established, the one would come to Italy at that point. So that's yet one of the reasons why I think they would do it. But also, it tells you how, how much negotial um, power they, you know, these vassals still had um, and how still, you know, they could influence even the same German affairs. And this is interesting because it, it's a concept that never came less historically, right? Um, there is, um, I have a colleague that, he, that studies these things mostly from a completely different perspective because he's, he, sa he specializes in, in the Habsburgs, Maximilian I, and he studies about the, the, the existence of a Ghibelline party in Italy at the time of Maximilian, the, the young Charles V, and there is this historiography today mostly, you know, having always snobbed the concept, right? Th saying essentially things like Ghibellinism, this pro-imperial sentiment, etc., was kind of ideal and or fictional or abstract or just a matter of mere convenience, see? And that such things did not exist. And it turns out instead that it's not quite the case and that there were many... Um, Italian noblemen, as a matter of fact, that were, by the way, were living, interestingly enough, also under, at that point, mostly in that northeastern dimension, but this, this, this was all over Italy, Italian Italy, but in that case, under the Venetians, that were technically not part of the Holy Roman Empire, nor subjects to it. And that, you know, even if few, un undoubtedly, still were absolutely um, loyal to the emperors, because it turns out, if one digs in their genealogy, and just, you know, even in the same 15th century, etc., you realize that we're often, uh, inter you know, married into, and sometimes literally also provided with important imperial offices in Germany, um, exactly because they were Ghibellines, they were foreigners, so also they were kind of, for, for the Habsburgic policy, that was interesting, because they could naturally operate with individuals that wouldn't, uh, let's say, uh, enrich to man to much the ranks of the of the German nobility. It could could contrast the same Habsburgs and that and that were often connected sometimes by non uh, maybe these were I don't know uh, even non noblemen that however were married 
to you know heiresses of local feudal titles that so this provided them with the idea that, that you know as they were imperially connected and um and they would get important uh, court uh, administrative offices and so on be in virtue of that so that kind of never came less right and that's something you can't see in many many contexts with the italians with the bohemians with um you know there are many people coming from from many areas in the same hungary and so on but we're talking about relatively early times right when you wouldn't quite expect uh you know the idea of you reason already by modern states modern identities but actually the the ancien regime and the uh, the universal values and feudal we were still there and they were there up to literally one century ago right and and just that that's a, a whole chunk of european history identity tradition culture that has been uh, erased by the blindness of you know um ethnic nationalism uh statalism totalitarianism communism fascism atheism all these things that has brought you know um you know the the, the, the appalling misery that we all know and that somewhat however people really still think in the matrix of when looking at history and not being able to distinguish literally the abc of what the actual european um culture was right and the, the real one was not the one of you know internationalism that just f flattered the masses in letting them think that they are minimally relevant or special just because they are born in somewhere they uh, under some somebody's flag right but because you know you know th th there is a quality a meritocracy a superiority of individuals that should be in charge right when they are valuable and deserving that while the others should you know at least try to 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 be always at at the top in the same ways if they want to be you know if they want to pretend they they can be considered in the same way uh so i don't know we always take rest because these are broader concepts but they they are relevant to the um, i believe to today's world view because of this reasons and uh, we'll keep talking about them we really made I'm glad about this. We made uh, on Schwerpunkt many videos about uh, post Carolingian Europe, and it's probably a, a a dimension, right? A time that we should consider as such. I mean, it's not that easy to to enucleate because what is post Carolingian? Is it before up to the Ottonians, or even maybe encompassing part of the Ottonians? Very important issues regarding to that because also the nature of the empire changed in a sense. It is true that. While the Carolingian Empire was frank, uh, frankly, in fact, a Frankish Empire, probably by definition, also if you know the the Romanity was recognized by the Papacy, but the Ottonians were not the Saxon Empire. They were the ones also with great difficult, you know, with great protest from the side. Of, think about the biographer Didokin and so on. They were the Roman Empire, the, the Empire of the Romans. So that even that sense of ethnic connection was surpassed in a universalistic sense by properly the Ottonian will institutions and so official titling etc that's yet another important step that tells you how there had been a, an important evolution even of certain concepts but they were also contingental um, many ways realpolitik and now we don't digress on that either but for now we stop it here just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content and for now i thank you heartily for listening to me i wish you a nice time and see you next time bye